Goku has overcome some extremely hard battles in the past. From battling the Demon King Piccolo at only age 16 to battling one of the most powerful wizards in all of existence, it seems like he's faced a myriad of terrifying opponents. However, when he comes in contact with himself, it seems like all hope is lost. But first, let's understand how we got here and how exactly these strange doppelgangers entered the Dragon Ball universe that many of us know and love. It all starts on January 29th, 2023 on Kinzoku Mato's Twitter page with this video. You see another person that looks identical to you. Run away and hide. In this video, we see Broly sitting on the couch watching the TV when he sees a strange alert stating that if you see someone who looks exactly like you, to run away and hide. This audio clip is from the video, The Mandela Catalog Volume 1 by Alex Kister. If you see another person that looks identical to you, run away and hide. If you see a person... Although, I'm guessing almost all of you are familiar with this series, as it's one of the most popular analog horror series on YouTube, with its most popular episode boasting 12 million views. For those who don't know, the only thing you need to know for this video is that this series revolves around alternates, entities that attempt to mimic their mainly human counterparts in every way. I should also clarify here that I won't be going over every single episode up until the most recent in Kensoku Mato series, as I've already gone over all of the posts up until June 3rd, 2023 in my previous video covering the series. That being said, there are a couple of key moments I need to cover in this video before we begin to unfold the most recent events in this series. The first post is from February 11, 2023 that coins the title and premise of the series. In this video, we see a Vegito alternate called David explain that in this series coined The Others, Dragon Ball characters will face their doppelgangers in some very unnerving and dangerous scenarios. It then goes on to explain that there is only one rule to this series. That rule being... Number one, we do what we want, because we want to have fun. We see an example of this in the same video, where David is able to blow away the wall revealing a depiction of the infamous eclipse scene from Berserk. Why did that happen? Simply because David could do it. This in itself is a pretty terrifying situation for our Z fighters, as this means that unlike every other enemy they fought, at least as far as I can remember, these creatures exist far outside of the laws of physics and reality. That probably leads you to wonder, can they win or is this battle already lost against these beings? And further, why are they specifically doppelgangers based off of these characters if they can do anything they want? Well, we get a little more understanding of these beings in the episode Hail to the Prince, which was posted on March 20th, 2023. The only thing you need to know about this episode is that during an encounter with an alternate of baby Vegeta from Dragon Ball GT, Vegeta quickly assumes his most powerful form, Ultra Ego. However, upon attacking the creature, Vegeta suddenly returns to base form. Kenzoku Mato explains this in the comments by saying, The doppelganger's main power, as they want to replace, act as a sponge. The more time they spend with you, the more they can use your power, and the less you can use yours. It goes fast, and it explains why Vegeta reversed. One, that their entire purpose is to replace their original counterpart on Earth. The reason why is still ambiguous though. Two, is that because of this purpose, they have specific advantages that will allow them to quickly adapt and defeat their counterpart. As if that couldn't be terrifying enough, not only are these creatures sole purpose to replace you, but they also have abilities that make it virtually impossible to beat them in a fair fight. This just seems, well, hopeless. In the March 28, 2023 post titled, in space, it's kind of frosty, Kenzoku Mato clarifies that these others don't have any specific requirements to meet to be able to absorb the powers of their doppelganger. With all of that being said, we can now finally get into the current story. Again, if you haven't seen the series, please check the links below to watch it yourself, and rest in peace to Akira Toriyama. We begin on June 15, 2023, with the video titled, the Dead Zone Incident. For those who don't know, Dead Zone refers to the both 1989 Dragon Ball Z film and an alternate dimension of darkness presented in said film by the villain Garlic Jr. called The Dead Zone. 
This is why in the beginning of this episode, we see Garlic Jr. getting thrown into the dead zone before it closes up. Afterward, we see a brief interaction between Piccolo and Kami before we get to the most horrific part of the episode. After a time skip of unknown length, we see Kami standing on his lookout before he senses another presence. Upon turning around, he sees none other than Demon King Piccolo, his evil counterpart that was killed by Goku many years ago. How could he be here? Before he has time to think, Demon King Piccolo quickly disappears and grabs Kami by the throat. Struggling for breath, Kami asks the creature what it really is. This is the response he's given. I am you. You are me. You complete me. Upon saying this, he removes the soul of Kami and absorbs it into himself, effectively making Kami's physical form disappear from existence. After another time skip, we see Piccolo in a similar situation, sensing an evil presence as his eyes briefly turn a glowing orange, much like the Demon King Piccolo alternate, before asking the same question that Kami did. However, this time we see the questions, who are we and who am I? This episode leaves us with a few questions and new understandings. For one, we now understand that when these creatures replace you, there will be no evidence of you left at all. Every trace of your physical being will disappear. Secondly, we also know that these creatures can only be complete after absorbing their doppelganger. What this exactly means, we don't know yet. Finally, we're posed with a question. Were those other questions at the end Piccolo asking someone else or himself? With that in mind, let's continue to A Beautiful Family Part 1. It starts off with Goku, his family, and Trunks enjoying themselves when suddenly the atmosphere changes. The glow of a key blast can be seen charging up, and knowing this series, whoever's doing this is definitely a foe. Piccolo sends an urgent message to Goku to run away, and he does so, taking everybody with him to Kame Sensei's house. For now, it seems that everyone's escaped danger. Goku, being the man he is, chooses to head towards a key signature that feels exactly like his. The second after he leaves, a hand appears on Goten's shoulder. At first, he mistakes it for Kame-sensei's hand, but upon turning around, he realizes that this is not a face he's ever seen before. In fact, it's the face of Goku's mother, Gine. For those confused, Kenzoku Mato stated that her hair was very similar to Goten's, so I'm guessing the creature just got confused. In a split second, the creature's bottom jaw is completely knocked off. Who could have done this? Well, it was Chi-Chi. And to be honest, I was really hyped for this moment. <gasps> Chi Chi's cooking! This is all I could have asked for! By the way, if you want to see my full initial reaction and analysis for several of the recent episodes in this series, check out my channel Gear Second. I post almost every day over there, kind of. Okay, I'm working on it. And it's basically a GT Live or Wendy Gang type channel. Anyway, this Gine type alternate is quickly defeated by Trunks. Remember, these doppelgangers can only siphon power from their original counterparts. Anyone else has a fair chance of defeating them if they're strong enough. In the second part of the Beautiful Family Saga, Goku appears in the grass in front of his house. However, he's quickly surrounded by complete darkness on all sides, very similar to the dead zone mentioned earlier. Unfortunately for Goku, he's confronted by basically every single character that resembles him in look. This means characters like his son Goten, his father Bardock, multiple former villains like Turles, and even his own child self are all after him specifically. With that, we've been led back to the place that we started this video at. So what exactly will Goku do against these overwhelming odds? Goku becomes seemingly overwhelmed seeing the distorted face of his father and his son, but quickly pulls himself together and asks the creatures who exactly they are. After answering with simply a smile, Goku realizes he's not getting anywhere talking to these things. That means there's only one thing to do. Before we continue the fight, there is one other post that we need to talk about. This image of Gogeta using his Soul Punisher attack against David. In a comment under the post, Kenzoku says, Soul Punisher against a monster with no soul. What could possibly go wrong? He then continues by saying, Our DB doppelgangers are empty shells. They want to replace. They want to be. Keep that in mind as we go back to the fight. 
As part 3 begins, Goku stands ready at full power, when suddenly, it all disappears. As we've already established, these things quickly steal and use the power of their counterparts. Before Goku can even question what happened, he's quickly slashed by Turles. As he flies back from the force of the slash, the only thing going through Goku's mind is, what's going on? He clutches his wound and attempts to achieve Super Saiyan to no avail. It's at this point that he realizes the hopelessness of the situation. In this state, he's easily beaten up by the weakest of the group. As he undergoes dozens of blows, he's still trying to understand why his ki depleted almost instantaneously. That doesn't matter now though. If only his body could move. If it could just... Goku manages to finally retaliate with a heavy punch that sends all three of them flying. However, in the end, we can see that it didn't do much damage. In the second half of part 3, the distorted image of Goten suddenly teleports away. As to why it did that, well... In the face of hopelessness, injured and facing himself, he chooses to give whatever he has left. As the doppelganger latches onto Goku's arm, he continues to give all he has which leads to him destroying the creature. A second victory. With nothing left, he's easily defeated by Goten's doppelganger. Unable to walk or even move, he's confronted by Goku Black's doppelganger who decides to use all of his power to finish him off. In the face of certain death, Goku manages to utter Kinto, a portion of the Japanese name of his flying Nimbus Cloud. With no time to waste, he's picked up by the cloud and is able to just barely escape. However, Goku Black and the other doppelgangers will always be on his trail. Just before he passes out, he manages to send Piccolo a message to protect Gohan. So I'm betting Gohan's gonna be in the next part, right? I was definitely right. Thus begins the itsy bitsy father saga. Everything seems normal as Gohan tells Pan goodnight after telling her that she couldn't have a sleepover. He relaxes on the couch with his wife Videl. Suddenly on the TV we hear that infamous clip. For some reason, neither Gohan or Videl are affected by this random strange warning on their TV. Pan, however, comes into contact with the exact threat mentioned in the warning. With that cliffhanger, Pan's fate is left unknown. Well, until the next part. Gohan and Videl hear Pan scream and immediately rush to her room. Before we're able to see the aftermath though, we see someone calling Gohan's cell phone. We'll find out who that is later. Pan seems okay, well, physically at least. However, when looking at her father, all she can see is the spider-like abomination that was trying to imitate him. This causes her to panic and immediately defend herself by releasing a ton of key energy, which as you can imagine, is not good. The next part of this saga starts off with a brief clip of the 1982 version of the horror classic, The Thing. This is relevant because The Thing is a movie about an alien that imitates other living organisms. Sound familiar? This is quickly cut off by a news report that states that there was a massive explosion and fire at the Capsule Core headquarters. If you don't know why that is, I again really urge you to catch up on the series using my previous video or by visiting Kenzoku Mato's pages below. Regardless, the individual watching the TV is not Gohan, but rather Big Bob, apparently. I'm not joking by the way, but there's a reason that he has this name. Big Bob refers to the Goliath Bird Eater Tarantula in the 1990 horror comedy movie Arachnophobia. So actually, the name is really good. Anyway, Bob here is on the phone with Chi Chi, the one who was calling Gohan in the previous part. 
He perfectly imitates Gohan's voice as he reassures her that nothing is wrong. Videl unknowingly asks Bob how he's already down there, assuming that it's Gohan. However, as she realizes that it's not, the original Gohan bursts through the ceiling, ready to confront the creature. Instead of responding with fear or anger though, Bob responds with excitement because he's finally found his original counterpart. He can finally fulfill his purpose. As the confrontation begins in the next part, Bob says something very interesting after Gohan tells Videl to flee. I would never hurt my precious wife and daughter. Whether you think at this point that he's mocking them or not, it's interesting to note that he regarded them that way. Bob also apologizes for scaring Pan, which again is interesting to note, but we'll get more into this later. After Videl flees the area with Pan, Gohan asks Bob what exactly he is. This is when we get a bit more insight into how these beings work. Bob says that his entire mission and reason for existing is to be complete, to defeat and replace Gohan in order to seamlessly assimilate into his life. He then says that he can't say more due to being young and ignorant to how things work. Perhaps the older members of his alien race understand why they have to do this, but for now, we can't know. Bob then continues by saying that much like Gohan is both human and Saiyan, he was made to be both Gohan and Yamcha. This more or less confirms the notion that these creatures are able to replace anybody they look very similar to, which obviously makes them more dangerous. Now the real fight begins. Unfortunately for Gohan, even a strike using Beast Key isn't enough to phase the creature. Bob quickly siphons Gohan's key and crushes his arm before preparing to deal what seems like the final blow. However, Gohan has one more trick up his sleeve. Before Gohan can deal this blow, however, a familiar hand grabs Bob's head and knocks him out of frame. If you're familiar with the Dragon Ball franchise, specifically Z and some of Super, you'll know that Piccolo has a habit of saving Gohan in times that seem otherwise hopeless. Piccolo tosses Gohan a senzu bean, telling him not to drop it this time, a reference to when Gohan has no hand-eye coordination for some reason in the Dragon Ball Super superhero movie. Then again, Gohan also couldn't catch that Patara earring in the Buu saga either, so eh, who knows. Either way, after getting Gohan to leave the area, Piccolo confronts Bob, who is clearly not very happy. We can also see visible damage on Bob for the first time as he comments that Piccolo is more than an anomaly. This means that Piccolo must have fused with his other counterpart instead of being replaced fully. Finally, the true battle begins. As the battle rages on, the two seem relatively evenly matched. Interesting note, you can also see Piccolo communicate with his other self at certain times, which is indicated by text color. Despite their power levels being seemingly close together, Piccolo does seem to be on the losing end of the confrontation. As Bob charges what seems to be a death blow, Piccolo anticipates the ferocious attack. Upon firing it, it seems like hope is lost. However, Piccolo is able to deflect the blow, and as the smoke clears, he begins charging up an attack of his own. This is his iconic special beam cannon, a move that was first introduced during the Saiyan Saga at the beginning of Dragon Ball Z. Bob seems to already know about this move, however, as he feints charging towards Piccolo and then dodges out of the way. But you must remember, that Piccolo has much higher battle IQ. Bob walks right into Piccolo's trap as he gets caught with a beam straight from Piccolo's mouth. Wait a minute, Gohan literally already did that to him, but he still got caught by it again? As Piccolo asks Bob if he has any last words, it seems like this may be the end. As the finale begins, Bob says that he can see Piccolo's other through him. Piccolo's other responds by saying that he succeeded in his mission, but as time passed, that destiny wanted something more from him. In my opinion, this means that he found another mission, one that he'll clarify as this part goes on. He then tells Bob that he wouldn't understand what he means and that he won't need to anyway. Bob then replies that he's happy that he could at least feel alive for once. 
To me, that says that all of these beings, these others, doppelgangers, whatever you want to call them, have their own individuality, but that that individuality is superseded by their natural instinct to replace their original counterpart. They're not truly able to live. Bob then comments on how beautiful the sky is, showing a side that we haven't seen from these beings until now. Suddenly, we see the face of Gohan, and as time goes on, we begin to go through iconic Gohan moments in the Dragon Ball series. Gohan's memories. The same memories that Bob possesses. This is why he said he would never hurt his wife and daughter earlier, because he also has memories of Pan and Videl. This is the only way that these beings can fully assimilate. Bob then comments that he wants Piccolo to take care of Gohan, of him. This part raises a few questions. If these beings possess some semblance of what we consider human empathy, emotional intelligence, and the memories of their original counterpart, could more of these beings become allies to Piccolo? Or is the only reason that Piccolo is able to fight against these beings because he fused with his counterpart, therefore nullifying the naturally aggressive and evil nature that we've seen many of these beings possess? In the final part of the saga, Piccolo tells Bob to stand proud before erasing him from existence. After collapsing, Piccolo has a conversation with his other self. Showing some compassion, huh? While I do what seems right to me, I do not take any joy in taking down my peers. Fair enough. They then speak about how the special beam cannon attack was interesting. Either way, this conversation shows that the other form of Piccolo fully believes that his peers should be wiped out in order to protect everyone else. In my personal opinion, this seems like a product of Piccolo's other seeing the results of success and realizing that no good comes out of erasing and assimilating. That unlike Bob, Piccolo's other had time to grow and mature to develop his own perspective and understanding on his situation and his mission, as well as the mission of others of his alien race. Because of that, he concluded on his own that it was wrong that this may mean that other creatures will also come to this conclusion, but at the very least it gives hope to the fact that the Z Fighters will have one very powerful ally on their side. To continue though, Piccolo is shocked to see that Gohan was there the whole time watching their battle. Piccolo gets angry at this and begins to choke Gohan for not listening to him before regaining control over himself. That was more than likely his other reacting with frustration. It's also interesting to note that in this scene you can see that Piccolo has two different eyes. He then tells Gohan that things happen and things changed. We end off with Gohan asking him to explain. Originally that was going to be all I covered in this video, but as I was working on this one, Genzoku Mato uploaded another saga that answers some very important questions about Piccolo and what these terrifying beings actually are. In Snailed It Part 1, Piccolo is relaxing outside of his home when suddenly a distorted version of that same audio from the Mandela catalog plays on loop. He then blurts out the same line we saw in A Beautiful Family Part 1, warning Goku. However, after this happens, Piccolo immediately grabs his mouth in confusion because he didn't say that. And if he didn't, who did? He collapses in front of his house, unable to process what's happening. Suddenly, he hears the voice of Kami speaking to him. Kami tells Piccolo that he doesn't have much time, but again, what exactly is going on? The sound continues to pervade Piccolo's mind as a green glow illuminates the lake behind him. A Namekian that looks like Nail exits the lake as Piccolo continues to battle with Kami internally. Kami attempts to persuade Piccolo by telling him that if he resists what's happening, it'll be even more painful. Despite his efforts to resist, Piccolo's right side begins to morph into a doppelganger. Unbeknownst to him, the Namekian had gotten much closer to him. Kami screams at him to watch out, and after hearing this, he turns around and sees... As Piccolo confronts this snail-like abomination of his friend, the Kami side of him immediately blasts the creature away with a strong key blast. Piccolo immediately asks Kami what exactly just happened and what is going on, and in response Kami chooses to show Piccolo exactly what happened. It plays images from the Dead Zone incident as Kami says this, What we've just witnessed and destroyed was one of my peers, a copycat being whose goal was to replace you in this world just like I did a long time ago. With this, 
Piccolo realizes that when he fused with Kami in the beginning of the Imperfect Cell Saga, that he merged with his doppelganger, his other. He's been fused with an alien doppelganger this entire time. Despite trying to share this information calmly, Kami's other can't stop Piccolo from becoming enraged, declaring that he will force this doppelganger out of his body, even if it takes both of their lives. His rage is interrupted by the voice of Goku, who is telling him to take care of Gohan after escaping his encounter with his own doppelgangers. Kami's other tells Piccolo he will explain everything before we skip back to now where Piccolo is flying with Gohan and his family. In their conversation, Kami's other explains that Garlic Jr's actions opened up a rift between the Dead Zone and the Earth. This allows these others, or Deadites, who are born in the Dead Zone, to reach the Earth. So they're not aliens, but rather interdimensional beings. Kami's Deadeye happened to be the first one to leave long before the others and fulfilled his purpose. In the end, he says that they need to gather the strongest warriors before it's too late. After they get Videl and Pan to safety, they'll try to find Goku, but they can see six other key signatures similar to his. His Deadites. Piccolo comments that it'll be a funny night. I suppose soon, they'll be confronting all of those Deadites that nearly took the life of Goku. So, we've gone from a story of pure terror about inhuman alternate creatures that seemed completely impossible to defeat, to a story about interdimensional creatures called Deadites from a canon place in the Dragon Ball universe who actually can be defeated. In this video alone, three of them were dealt with. It seems as time goes on, that this story will only get better and better. I'm most excited to see what happens with Goku, wherever he is.